All right, let's get started. People will join us. Hi, uh, I am Lisa Cohen. I'm the director of the DuPont Columbia Award at uh, Columbia Journalism School. Many of you are either students or past students, but I think we have some other people here, so that's exciting. Um, I run the DuPont Awards. It's a distinguished journalism prize that for 75 years has honored the very best of audio and video reporting um, in the public interest. And we are open for entries on May 1st, so I'm gonna put in a plug for that. And today we're gonna to be talking to a multi-DuPont award winner, Clarissa Ward, who is coming to us from London, where it's 5 p.m. Um, and every year we have a fancy ceremony in the Low Memorial Library on campus. Um, she was here in January uh, to get her latest DuPont, um, which was for a team reporting for CNN for uh, reporting on the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And we're going to see a little bit of that reporting as we get started. But you can see uh, Clarissa getting her award. Um, the event is being co-sponsored by the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which is also at the J School, which is also a great resource. And its leader, Bruce Shapiro, Shapiro is doing a lot of Zoom events in these times on topics around trauma. So um, check out the DART website for those. And um, Clarissa is the Chief International Correspondent for CNN. Um, and this was supposed to be an in-person visit to the J School. I know, it's a sad thing, but, and if you wanna look at it in a better light, that means people can tune in from all over the world. So um, we're hoping to have her back in the fall to talk to us about her reporting and also her upcoming memoir on all fronts. Um, I'm just gonna give you a brief intro. Uh, she is uh, based out of London, as I said. She has been reporting from conflict zones, all kinds of far-flung places, pretty much since her career started right out of college with a break to be the stand-in for Uma Thurman. And <laughs> that's like a whole thing we're not gonna get into here, but she was in Iraq, she's to Beirut, she went to Beijing and Moscow for ABC News. Then at CBS News, she won her first DuPont Award after sneaking into Syria uh, by herself with a little handheld camera and we'll talk about that later. Now she's at CNN um, and again in London coming to us in the evening where she lives with her husband and her toddler son and soon to be new baby. Very exciting. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening Clarissa. What's happening in London? Um, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm very much hoping that my toddler is not going to make a cameo. Um, he has been, um, you know, put downstairs for a while, but if you do hear any high pitched screaming, it's not a, a torture dungeon that I have. It's just a very overactive two year old on lockdown. And I just got home about half an hour ago. I was doing some live shots on the street talking about how, uh, the UK it's transpires now that the UK has been actually misrepresenting inadvertently its death toll, um, categorizing it as being 52% lower than it was because they weren't counting people who were not dying in hospital. They were only counting people dying in hospitals. They weren't counting nursing homes. They weren't counting residential homes. So basically they weren't taking into account all the elderly people who are dying from coronavirus. So that's been my day today. Yes, I think that's happening everywhere. It's certainly happening in the United States. Um, what we're going to start, we're going to talk about COVID reporting um, and we're going to talk about things you might say that could help our students as they're trying to report in this difficult time. But um, I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about your DuPont award winning reporting this that won this past year. And that was uh, the uh, coverage for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And um, I would love to start just by showing everyone um, a little clip. Let me just say that um, I'll ask some questions and then we're going to have some time for audience to participate. Um, but let's go ahead and play the video of the an, a small excerpt that aired during the ceremony in January that features Clarissa. Telling CNN that they even believe the Saudis went 
Turkish officials here are convinced that the killing of Jamal Khashoggi was a premeditated murder. And they're now telling CNN that they even believe the Saudis went to the extent of sending a body double here to pose as Khashoggi, leaving the consulate in an attempt to cover up the killing. CNN, CNN has obtained exclusive surveillance footage. It is part of the government, uh, the government investigation, and it appears to show Allison just that. Take a look. At first glance, this man could almost pass for Jamal Khashoggi, and that's the idea. These are the last known images of Khashoggi alive, moments before he entered the Saudi consulate. Take a look. Same clothes, same glasses and beard, similar age and physique, everything except the shoes. But a senior Turkish official tells CNN that the man on the left is a body double, one of 15 Saudi operatives sent to kill Khashoggi and then cover it up. His name is Mustafa Al Madani. Surveillance cameras capture him arriving at the consulate in a plaid shirt and jeans at 1103 with an accomplice. Two hours later, Khashoggi arrives. He was killed inside shortly afterwards. Well, Khashoggi's fiance waited in front of the consulate. We're told El Medini came out through this back exit. Disturbingly, he appears to have been wearing the actual clothing of the murdered journalist. The intent, Turkish investigators say, was to perpetuate the lie that Jamal Khashoggi left the consulate unharmed. Wow. Extraordinary. Um, this was just, as I said, an extraordinary team effort. Uh, there were a series of scoops. This was one of them. And you, can you talk us through a little bit about the reporting in general and how this particular piece of reporting came to light? So, you know, when you're doing a story like this, it's always really tough because you're relying on sources. You don't have the ability to go and see for yourself exactly what happened. And that can be very frustrating. I was very fortunate in that I had attended a small conference uh, about Saudi Arabia about two months before Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. And there were some very interesting and very important people at this conference. I got to spend a couple of days talking with them Sometimes these conferences are a total waste of time, I'll be honest. This one was particularly useful because it was small. And if it's small, then it is usually a really good chance to do some serious networking and develop sources and develop relationships with people who can help inform your reporting. So definitely that was hugely beneficial to me when it came time to try to get to the bottom of what had happened to Jamal and what was being done about it. As you mentioned, this was a team effort, and I really can't emphasize that enough. I mean, we had something like eight different reporters on this story, uh, three from Istanbul. We had people in Saudi Arabia. We had people in, you know, Washington working that beat. We, ha I mean, it was a huge collective. Um, and I think particularly our international diplomatic editor, Nick Robertson, who actually collected the award with me, who has been going to Saudi Arabia now for, you know, two decades and has excellent, excellent connections. Um, he was very much instrumental in getting some of those scoops. With regards to the body double scoop, which yeah. was kind of the piece de resistance, uh, you know, and keep in mind, this was like a long slog. Uh, normally, with a story, it's like you go in, you go hard, it's a few days of craziness and then it starts to taper off. With Jamal Khashoggi, it took so long, it was really weeks and weeks and weeks of reporting to really find out what happened to him. And, and that requires a lot of stamina. But our Istanbul bureau chief, um, Gul Tusus, who has like amazing contacts uh, with elements of the Turkish government, and the Turkish government had been dripping and, you know, little drip feed of scoops to various different print outlets. They really hadn't given anything to any television outlets. Um, and after many weeks of waiting and, and sort of knocking on doors and really pushing our case and going to meetings and 
Google was able to obtain this video from a very good source. As I'm sure many of your students already understand, that's really just like the first step is obtaining the video. Then you have to do what you can to try to verify the authenticity of the video. Then you have to work out from a storytelling perspective how you use the video in a sort of coherent way because not everybody is following the minutia of the news the way we are as journalists. So you have to kind of lay it out as, and especially with this story with the body double, I wanted this to be like, you know, you're watching an Agatha Christie sort of, you know, because it had that feel to it, like this sort of cinematic quality of like, you cannot make this up. Um, and it, really, and it really did, you know, it nailed the, the fact that this had been a premeditated thing, the fact that they had And that was, I mean, that, I think the reason it got so much attention was exactly because of that, because the Saudis had really been trying to perpetuate this narrative that, yes, it appeared that Jamal was dead, but it was completely inadvertent, and it wasn't supposed to happen, and he had just gone in, and then there was a ruckus, and somehow he had been killed. Well, when you have someone on that plane, one of those 15 Saudi operatives who's been sent to be a body double, I think it's pretty safe to assume, at the very least, it was certainly intentional that he was never going to leave that consulate. You could make the argument, I guess, that they wanted to render him, uh, or rendition him back to Saudi Arabia. But whatever it was, it was certainly premeditated. Can you talk, I don't know how granular you can get, but can you talk a little bit more about how you corroborate something like, and you get video like this, it feels like this is some kind of political thriller movie. How crazy is this idea that they brought someone in? So yeah. what, what steps do you take? Because if you get this wrong, oh my God. No, I mean, and, and, and everyone's really cognizant of that. And it's very important to remember that while the Saudis were definitely the bad guys in this narrative, the Turkish government had its own agenda too. Right. And, and they sort of happened to be on the, on, on the side of good in this instance, but they were definitely releasing this information in a piecemeal way that was very much political in terms of, of what their objective was, that was designed to humiliate Saudi Arabia and to kind of prolong the agony as it were. So you can't just take at face value, oh, Turkey says this video is that. But what we did, you know, you start to look at things like the timestamps on the video, right? Because, because a lot of it was surveillance footage, there was a lot of, there were many timestamps. Um, you maybe would reach out to a couple of different, uh, because, you know, it's the same in any government, but there's not just one seat of power within the Turkish government. So if this came from the, foreign office, let's say, and I'm not saying it did, then you might go to someone in the security services and try to see if they could verify it with you. Or if you know somebody who's very connected, um, you know, in the judiciary, whatever it is, you try to find someone else within the sort of broader apparatus of, of Turkish authorities who could maybe either um, help you authenticate the video or at the very least authenticate the source behind it. In this case, we had known the source behind the video for a long time, which does go a very long way. And they're absolutely ironclad, solid, legit. Um, so we felt much more comfortable. Um, but then of course you also have to go to the Saudis. You can't go too early, but you do need to go to give them an opportunity to comment. Uh, in this case, that was sort of a non-starter because really, a big problem I think that the Saudis had throughout this whole um, debacle is that they don't have an effective and efficient uh, communications policy or director or they, they do have people who work in the royal court who liaise with the media, but they're not able to do the kind of ad hoc, hi sir, can I call you to confirm this? Hello, do you have a response to this? it's sort of you don't hear from them for days and days or weeks on end and then you might get some kind of a statement but probably not um which makes it harder when you're when you're trying to lock down something like this and then you might also I, you know you probably also go in something like this sort of an incident to us so if you have good contact with someone in us security services you might be like hey 
without showing it to them, this is what we're hearing, we've got this video, does this sound feasible to you? It really depends on how confident you are in the source who gives you the video in the first place and how confident you are in the video. Like I said, things like the timestamps helped us to, to feel more confident that yes, this video was legit. And you don't show it to the US, you don't show the video to anyone first? Like you just said you, you ask somebody about it, but you don't necessarily show it to anyone. I wouldn't necessarily show it to them, no. I mean, it would depend. In this instance, I don't believe we showed it to anyone in the US. Um, I would have to double check that with some of my colleagues. But uh, yeah, in general, I tend to err on the cautious side in terms of like sharing or showing video like that. Um, I might, if I feel good enough about the source and whoever I'm talking to feels like it sounds like it's legit, then I'll probably, yeah. And you're obviously not unilaterally deciding, okay, we're ready to no, go. No, no. And, and, and in this instance, especially because it was, you know, turned into like a huge global fiasco and it was also a geopolitical game of chess and it was a massive story at CNN. And when you have that much, you know, CNN is really, really risk averse in general um, with, with things like, you know, getting a source wrong or getting a story wrong. And for very good reason, we're much too big to, to get something wrong. People are not gonna be indulgent if we get it wrong. So we have a system at CNN, which is called the triad, which can be something of a nightmare in terms of it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy to sort of wade through when you're trying to push a story through quickly, but it works. And basically what the triad is, it's three layers. It's uh, an editor with something we call the row, which is like your basic fact checking, making sure you have the story right. Then you have someone from standards, making sure that, you know, that CNN standards are being adhered to. And then you have someone from legal. Um, so it's like this three headed behemoth and putting something like this story through the triad is, yeah, I mean, that's going to take you a couple of days. There's going to be multiple conference calls. There's going to be endless questions about it. Then you have to shuttle back to your source or, you know, because as I said, you can, you can't afford to get that wrong. You need to make sure you've got it right. And it can be really frustrating, but it, you feel so much better when the piece goes on air because you just, you know that you've got it right. And it's not just you right. sort of hanging out in the breeze if you know something were to go wrong. So let me just pivot and, and take you back to the beginning a little bit. Um, tell us, you know, sort of how you got into this business. Did you always want to be a journalist? Uh, students who come to the J School are very passionate usually about yeah, you know, my story is a little more unusual, I guess, in that I didn't, I was really into acting when I was younger, um, and my childhood was really split between New York and London, um, and I was like a member of the National Youth Theatre here in London, then I went to college in the U.S., and I was studying like French and Russian and Italian literature. I was always very into languages and travel and storytelling, I guess you could say. And then in my senior year, 9-11 happened uh, at the very beginning. And it was just a sort of, I mean, look, everyone, or maybe not some of, <laughs> some of these students are now probably, uh, you know, can barely remember it. Um, but for a lot of us, it was a moment of, you know, just profound change, profound shock, profound epiphany in my case, which was, that I knew I wanted to better understand what was going on with the world. I knew I wanted to be more engaged. And I had this sort of idea that I really wanted to be, because I had traveled a lot and my father had lived in Hong Kong from when I was 14. And uh, one of my best friends is uh, Palestinian living in Abu Dhabi. And so I had spent a lot of time in different, in different countries in the Middle East, in the Far East. And I loved languages, so I had this idea that I sort of wanted to act as a kind of go-between, almost, between uh, between cultures, between different uh, societies and different ideologies, and trying in some capacity to act as a kind of communicator. It was all very much full of hubris, uh, you know, I was 21 years old, 
and I definitely had a steep learning curve. Um, but it was, it was a huge, hugely fortunate thing for me, not 9-11, but to be, to be fortunate enough to have that sense of a vocation that hits you like a lightning bolt. And then you just suddenly are like, this is the only thing that matters. This is the only thing I care about. And I've been asked many times in my career since, like, why don't you go on the campaign trail for once or like cover an election or do more anchoring or move stateside? Or, and for me, it, I'm very focused on what it was that got me into journalism that motivates me still, which is international news, bridging cultural gaps and, um, you know, with various levels of success, obviously. <laughs> Quite a lot of success. But I, um, very specifically, were you almost, were you immediately drawn to conflict reporting at that age or? Yeah, I was, I was. And I, I don't have a good answer for why I think, look, there's a part of you that will say, oh, I want to give a voice to the voiceless and I want to get to the places other people can't go to. That's definitely always been a motivating factor to me as I, I, I see the place that, that, that no one else gets to and I'm like, why can't we go there? Why can't we understand that? Um, but then there's also another part that I think a lot of journalists don't talk about as much because it doesn't fit into a nice narrative, which is we like adventure, we like excitement, we like to be challenged in ways that are mind blowing. We like uh, danger. We like danger. I mean, I genuinely don't love danger, um, but I like to be like as close to danger as I can without really being at risk. And I think a lot of us suffer from an inability, probably, to do a sort of more balanced, normal nine to five office type of job. I mean, for me, when people ask me about anchoring, I'm always like, how could I like wear a dress every day and go into a studio and, and work? I mean, and you know, let's see, after having the second baby, I might be like, you know what? Anchoring's look, anchoring is suddenly looking really great. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not there yet. And um, do you have, do you think you have a different feeling about going to those places, taking the risks? Cause you have taken some risks. I mean, mm -hmm. snuck into Syria, by yourself when your partner couldn't get a visa and you know shot all your own stuff and got yourself caught in the middle of a firefight. Um, do you feel like that's changing at all or has changed over time? I mean, I, what I will say is that the more really dangerous situations I have been in, the more cognizant I am of the fact that life is very precious and that, um, that death is not something to be kind of trifled with. I think when you're starting out, you feel a sort of invincibility and there's an arrogance that comes with, with real youth and inexperience and you just never think it's gonna happen to you. The first time when I was 25 years old and I was in Baghdad on a rotation as a producer, and our hotel compound was attacked. It was a triple suicide car bombing. And that was the first time I really thought I was gonna die. And it does change you because first of all, you realize, wow, you realize the seriousness of it and the intensity of it and the idea that you could actually really die. I mean, it's just so wild in that moment. You're like, what am I even doing here? How could I possibly die here? This is crazy it doesn't make any sense um and then you know the moment passes and you don't die and then you all are kind of excited talking about what just happened and and there's a buzz and an adrenaline that comes with having lived to tell the tale and it can be easy to forget that moment of clarity that came beforehand where you were like wow this is real um, but the more you experience that, I think the more you are, I, well, at least the more I am cautious, A, but B, risk averse, and I have a much lower threshold. I never enjoyed being caught in a firefight ever. Some people do actually kind of find it really exciting. I always found it petrifying and, and I still find it kind of petrifying and I really will go out of my way to avoid it, um, if at all possible. 
I, I think everyone also has different kinds of risks that they're able to take or that they, so for me, I tend to, the kinds of risks I tend to take are based on building relationships with bad guys, but getting to a level of trust where I feel comfortable. So I went into Syria on my own to interview a Western jihadi. I went into Taliban territory with my female producer to spend two days with the Taliban. Um, those kinds of things, some people are like, that's crazy, that's so dangerous, that's insane. I feel more comfortable with that because I've spent months negotiating that source, building that relationship, establishing that trust. And so it feels a little more in my control. Whereas when bullets are flying, I'm very uncomfortable with that because I can't control any of that mm -hmm. beyond trying to get out of it. So, so yes. And obviously having a kid also does, it definitely changes the calculation. It's not just about you anymore. Right. Um, talking about the other side of that kind of reporting, which is the trauma aspect of it. And um, that's in two parts. One is, what it does to you as a reporter, and how, how you cover things where you are clearly, mm -hmm. are clearly in the midst of a lot of people who are in pain and suffering. Yeah. And does that, are there things that you do when you're, when you're dealing with subjects that are going through those kinds of things that are? You know, I mean, it's such a good question. Um, I think covering Syria made me realize that the idea of neutrality is uh, just not really realistic <laughs> um, in certain kinds of reporting. And that's why you have, if you're covering a war, you gotta have people on different sides telling the different stories. Because if I am covering the rebel side and I am living with these people and sleeping with their families and watching them get mowed down um, by a far superior army and seeing dead bodies on the side of the road that have been brutally tortured. I can't pretend then to be like on the one hand and on the other hand, right? And I also can't pretend and, and some people maybe are better at it than I am. I can't pretend not to care. I can't pretend not to be moved by it. I can't pretend that I'm able to just leave it at the door when I come home. And I think that the more honest that you are with yourself about the, the way that it affects you and becomes a part of you and becomes a part of your life, and the more therapy, frankly, that you do, um, and I always tell people, it doesn't matter if you're sad or not, or having bad dreams. I'm like everybody who does this work should be checking in with a therapist from time to time, because you don't know how it's affecting you, but it is affecting you. Okay. And it's like the coronavirus curve. Like by the time you realize it's affecting you, you're too late. You need to start the work beforehand because that's the way that trauma works. It's not an immediate thing always. It sinks into your bones really slowly and insidiously and plays out in your life in ways that you don't expect. And you, you sort of only learn that as you go along, but the more you become self-aware about it, the more militant you are about self-care and the more you are realistic about the parameters of neutrality versus how you feel and how you view things. And, and, and the more you're honest about that, the more manageable it becomes. But you do also have to draw boundaries. And it, I've never been very good with boundaries. <laughs> and that's something I talk about a lot in the book. And with Syria, in the end, I, I, I did have to say, I had to put in some boundaries because it was too all consuming and I was definitely losing myself in the story as well in the sense of I could no longer say I was objective. I don't think I ever reported anything incorrectly or anything like that, but I was very clearly taking a side, let's say. So what kind of boundaries did you stop reporting from Syria? I, I, it started out that I would take longer breaks between reporting trips. I, um, and then, yeah, I, I, I really had to just stop 
for a while and stop and get, you know, a part, big part of my life because I have built up all these amazing sources in Syria. So every day on my phone, WhatsApp and Telegram and Signal and talking to, you know, rebels from here and civilians from there and jihadis from here. And, you know, and it, it ended up taking up like hours of my day and, you know, people would come to me a lot. Can you do a story in this? Can you do a story in that? Can you give a speech on this? Can you talk about that? Can you be involved with this charity? Can you, and I really had to slowly start scaling it down um, a little bit because it was really, it was really threatening my, my personal life in, in so many ways. Yeah. I just wasn't present when I was at home. I didn't feel alive when I was at home. I didn't feel uh, engaged or, and it's, it's not a healthy way to be. It's not as sustainable. You, there, there, you do have to have boundaries and it's very hard because the fewer boundaries you have, the better your work gets. So you're taking all these risks and your work is amazing. And you've got this great access because your sources are good. And, and you're putting all your heart into it and your passion. And, and so the work is great, but it's not sustainable. And so, yeah, I think for me, it was really a question of like, okay, there's other stories out there too. Let's do, let's try to do great work on, on other stories. And it, it, it's taken a while, but I feel like I'm getting better at that. <laughs> and, and I have to say, I was lucky enough to be able to read an advanced copy of your book and you talk quite eloquently about the things you were struggling with. And I think it's, it's a great lesson for when it comes out for people to read about it. And, and yeah, you know, there's still a taboo about this stuff, which is so funny to me in this day and age where we do talk more and more openly about mental health and, and, and trauma and PTSD and all these issues. It's still, you get a group of journalists who cover war together and they will never talk about this. They will get unbelievably drunk and make jokes a lot, like gallows humor, um, and can see that, oh yeah, maybe I had a bit of a tough time with that or whatever. But it's certainly, it's certainly, it's only just now becoming acceptable. And I think it should be mandatory anyone who does this work just check in with someone and 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 just check in that you're that you're dealing with it that you're processing it and and also remember that different people respond in different ways right and so it's there is no one size fits all approach to 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 trauma or uh, witnessing other people's trauma. And even when you're not witnessing it, by the way, you know, I talk to people on our desk and stuff who during the worst of the Syrian civil war, are spending 12 hours a day looking at these videos on YouTube of whether it's beheadings or massacres, that is absorbed somewhere. You don't have to be there in person and see it. It is absorbed and everybody needs to be mindful of that, I think. And I think that really um, is, that is appropriate to the story that's the big story today too as well, because there's just so much of what people are seeing that's so disturbing, the stories are so disturbing. Um, you talked about putting your attention elsewhere and that leads me to ask you a little bit about the story of the day, which mm. um, it's funny because I saw, I, I saw an Instagram post of yours a couple of weeks ago and you were like, shout out to my good college friend who's in a, you know, who's a frontline doctor and there she is. And now t this weekend there was a story about her and you were inside Mount Sinai, not you physically, but we as a, as viewers got to look inside. How, how did that story come about? And is that how you're trying to do this work now? Yeah. So, uh, you know, listen, COVID-19 is a really difficult story to cover. Um, and I think it's particularly difficult if you're used to doing the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, and let's just sort of put aside the fact that I'm pregnant for a second, because that only complicates it. If I wasn't pregnant, I would have zero fear right now about going into a hospital if I had all the proper protective garb and doing those kinds of stories. But it's incredibly difficult to get access 
to these hospitals, um, particularly here in the UK uh, and in Europe, generally speaking. So you're talking about a war with an invisible enemy and almost no access or very little access to the front lines. In some ways, I feel like as, as, as war correspondents, we're better prepared for this, right? Because a lot of people, the effects of the lockdown, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I, everyone, I think we're all finding it difficult in various ways, but doing the work that I've done, I have spent like protracted periods of time where I am not able to move anywhere, where I am confined to a certain space with a very sort of intense amount of rules that are placed upon me and on my physical freedom. I'm thinking primarily of reporting from Baghdad back in 2005, 2006, when it was at the most dangerous and we couldn't leave our compound. Um, and I'm used to seeing terrible things happen. It sounds awful. Um, so you, you feel more prepared in that way. Obviously, it's always different when it's playing out in your backyard and across the entire world, and there's no place where you can kind of escape to at the end of your six-week rotation to uh, go and decompress because everyone is going through the same thing. So it is unprecedented in that sense. But at another level, I feel like I would be so raring to go with this story if I wasn't pregnant and therefore, you know, more complex risks at hand. So, okay, so you're like, okay, so I can't go to the hospital um, and either because I can't get just, in. Let me just stop you for one second, which is to tell you that our students are not allowed to do that kind of reporting because... Yes. No, and by the way, it's not just your... Like some... some uh, CNN's done some amazing work. Miguel Marquez, I really encourage you guys to watch some of his reports from uh, New York hospitals, which have been tremendous. Other networks are not going into the hospitals. Um, at least as far as I'm aware. Yeah. And so, it, you know, there isn't a sort of one size fits all approach to this again. But so then we have to think of, okay, if we can't get into the hospital, either because we can't get access or we don't feel comfortable or it's too risky, whatever, then how do we do this? How do we tell this story? Um, it happened that my best friend from college, uh, my roommate of four years, is an attending physician at Mount Sinai Brooklyn Hospital. And in the beginning, I just sort of suggested to our, my colleagues at Domestic, because obviously I'm not in New York, I said, listen, I know this amazing doctor. Um, why don't you guys do a story on her? And I can ask if she'd be willing to do it. And she was. And so they said, yes, yeah. CNN said, yes, but why don't you do it? Because it'll be nice for her to be doing these video diaries for you because while it's sort of unusual to do a story about a good friend in this instance it creates it can be a positive thing because you have this sort of intimacy and comfort and familiarity that comes with knowing the person who you're doing the video diary for or talking to having that voice in your head and so we put these videos together and then I interviewed her at the end of them. And I think, you know, it's a piece I'm actually quite proud of, firstly, because I think it's really nice to celebrate the, you know, in my mind, undisputed heroism of these healthcare workers. And also it was nice to sort of have the human element of my good friend, Melanie is a widow. Um, she has three children. So even when they're not on the front line, so to speak, when they go home, it is incredibly challenging, incredibly difficult, exhausting. And um, I think in a culture which generally has spent years and years sort of worshiping celebrities and influencers on Instagram, it is so nice to see that we are taking this moment to celebrate workers of all different you know, uh, types of backgrounds who are really the people keeping this country going right now. So I'm gonna um, let some people ask some questions. We have a few questions in the chat. We also have some links in the chat to the pieces that we're talking about, especially this past one. You can click on it and see Clarissa with her friend. Um, I have one more question before I ask, which is if you don't have a friend that you went to college with for four yeah. years, yeah. Uh, do you have any tips on how our students- Yeah, I mean, you know, I approach it as well in the same way 
I didn't have any friends who were Western jihadis either, you know, back in the day. And like, you go out and you find them. So there's chat rooms, there's Facebook groups, there's, you call every friend you know, do any of your friends have, uh, know anyone who works as, I mean, what I did in the UK, for example, and in the UK, I wasn't so much wanting to do a video diary, but I really wanted to put together uh, a strong sense of like how hospitals are operating, how they make the difficult determination of who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. So I basically put a call out to like all of my friends who grew up here in the UK, who knows doctors, who knows nurses. And then, you know, I WhatsApp like 20 different people and like 10 got back to me and then five actually called me. And then it, it takes time, uh, that kind of stuff. It's very sort of labor intensive, but um, it's really well worth it. And then once you make that connection, you've had that one conversation that you don't even need to be best friends. Now, anytime something happens in the UK, like Boris Johnson, the prime minister is in the ICU. I can, I got three doctors I can message straight away being like, now obviously they're not going to give me personal information about how Boris is doing, but what they can do is provide me with context. So when he was originally sent to the hospital, they said, Oh, precautionary tests. And I'm like, what is that? I don't know what that means. You know, if you know, he has COVID, what tests are we talking about? So it was so useful to have those doctors being like, well, this is what we might look at, a lung x-ray, a CT scan of the chest, et cetera. So it's all about building up those sources. It's the hardest thing to do in journalism. It takes a really long time. You get a lot of doors slammed in your face, but it's so important. Well, and also at the beginning of this chat, you talked about how you went to this conference and it wasn't at a time when you were doing a story about Jamal Khashoggi. It was just, no. this is a time to be able to develop this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of people who have, um, who have already chatted some questions and um, you can put them into the chat and we'll ask you them. Um, the one that was a little earlier on when you were talking about the, the video about the, the body double, um, have you ever had to deal with quote unquote fake or altered videos that you've encountered? Oh yeah, all the time all the time um and i think the the lessons mostly learned there happened sort of early on in the syrian conflict um where you were just being inundated there was no one in there uh, you know with the exception of a few of us who had managed to sort of sneak in for a week here or there um in those early in that first year really there were very 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 few people who were able to get in and so you're relying on social media material and social media material is notoriously difficult to authenticate. And, um, you know, I think it's now getting a little bit easier because you see, especially young journalists and Bellingcat and open source information. And there are, you know, we're learning skills to verify things, to uh, geolocate happenings and, that makes it that much more, um, it makes it easier basically to, to authenticate happenings. And well, we had a few instances that I can remember in the Syrian civil war where a videos, not on my watch or on, on my channel, but where videos were being aired that turned out to be professionally shot to, you know, look dramatic. Right. Um, and so, yeah, you have to be, you've got to make sure if something happened in Hama on this day at this time, I need to see another 10 videos and see, watching all of them, if I can tell that, yeah, okay, this, these shots match, the scene matches, this is real. Great. Um, so another question we had earlier on is, given the constraints on many people, including us journalists, um, what international stories would you say aren't getting the attention that they deserve? Can you name a couple? Oh, I mean, there's so many. I, you know, I, between COVID-19 and President Trump, <laughs> it, um, I mean, it's obviously, it's a really, I mean, COVID-19 is unprecedented. And, but even before, uh, I think it's really tough to get a lot of these international stories on. One of them, I would say, is Idlib. Uh, Syria, where you still have three and a half million civilians uh, being slowly crushed um, by the Russians in the regime. 
and there's no real sense of how it's going to be dealt with or you know and hospitals continue to be bombed and schools continue to be bombed and the world continues to do nothing and and it's difficult because we've now had nine years of this so yes fatigue does set in yes people feel uh, what can we do there's nothing we can do but we do have to keep telling the story um and we do have to keep thinking of ways to hold people accountable for war crimes we can't get used to, and i know that people have actually had the same conversation talking to colleagues at covering the Trump presidency, where it's like, what do we do? Do we like, we can't keep every tweet, you know, and you're torn between being like, we can't just keep doing this and then being like, but no, we have to, we have to keep holding people accountable and people in power accountable for their actions at home in the U S and overseas. So I would say Idlib Syria is, um, is a really big one. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting things going on in India under President Modi and the marginalization of Muslims and uh, really sharp uptick in nationalism there, uh, which barely gets any attention. And even China, you know, I mean, obviously China is now kind of more uh, in focus because of the coronavirus, but even before that, I think China's role as a superpower, um, the, the sort of economic chokehold that the US and China have each other both in, these are really important stories and they're very challenging. And I know because I lived in Beijing for two years and, and economic stories are always hard to tell. And, but we should be telling that and gosh, we should definitely be doing even more to tell the story of what is happening to Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province in China, um, because it's shocking beyond belief. And it's upsetting to see how basically China can get away with it simply because there aren't, no one can see it, you know? So if you don't have video of it, then does it actually happen? They saw what happened during the Syrian uprising and they realized that you, if you really want to crush any kind of an uprising or any form of dissent, you really need to take people's cell phones away as well, because that is still a, a valuable weapon. So yes, lots of stories out there that that aren't getting covered right now, but um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll keep fighting to get them covered. And somebody says, how do we find a way to get all these stories on the air? I mean. And there's so much, also, you know, listen, there's only so much people can take, okay? Especially right now, we're dealing with an unprecedented crisis. It's a health crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's an economic crisis, okay? So no one has the bandwidth right now. Uh, and I understand that. And that makes perfect sense. And, and, and in a sense, I think the best thing we can do right now is all work out how we can contribute to covering this story. And it is such a challenging story because we don't know yet how it ends or where it goes or who's really right or what the answers are. I mean, we're as in the dark as anyone is. Um, but it is going to be the story of uh, certainly of the year um, and maybe of next year too. Um, so we all need to work out ways to help the public understand that. So a couple of questions about advice to young journalists. One person specifically wanted to understand how you make the switch from producer to correspondent. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, then, and then maybe some more general other pieces of advice that you might Yeah. Have. So the, the going from producer to correspondent is, look, a producer is, I, that's how I started out. I think it's the greatest education you can get. You work with an experienced correspondent, you learn from them, you understand how to news gather in the field, how to put together a story. Um, at a certain point, you need to make it known to people that you work with that your, your dream is to be in front of the camera. I have personally, and I know most of my colleagues feel the same way, worked really hard to help any producer who wants to be in front of the camera. And uh, so I think most people are very cool about that. I know it feels awkward. I felt very shy when I wanted to be in front of the camera, sort of saying that it seemed like it was embarrassing somehow or presumptuous, but you do need to kind of get over that and say, would it be okay if 
I could start to put together a clip reel. Maybe when we're out on a shoot, could I shoot a stand up here or there? Um, you know, um, could I do a live shot on a weekend? Whatever it might be. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. It's the worst part of it, or for me at least, I've always found it's the most uncomfortable part of it because you want to get that line between being confident but not arrogant and not, you know, and sort of, you know, pushing but not pushy. And it's always, it's a delicate balance. Um, but if you are working really hard and you're making it clear to whoever you're producing for that your priority is still to be a producer but this is very much what you want to do in the long run and, and on the side where there's time, can you help me try to make that happen? Then I think most people will try to make that happen in terms of more broadly. Also, can I just, can I yeah. just, but in there for a second, my tip would be if you work with a camera crew that you really admire who does yes. great work, 100%. get them to teach you things, get them to work with you. because 100%. No, no, the camera is going to be your best friend. And, you know, things have changed a lot as well since I was, you know, up and coming. Uh, I would say now it's like you need to learn how to shoot yourself as well. Um, you need to know the basics of editing. You need to understand the technology of how to feed video um, to different you know, different places. So the demands on young journalists are a lot higher, definitely. Right. But what's exciting about it is that like, you guys really can one man band a lot of stuff, at least while you're starting out. We're all now, you know, with coronavirus and working at home and stuff, it's like me sitting there like trying to jerry rig a light to this and that. And you know, you guys are like, please, I've been doing this. <laughs> You're much better at that. And that gives you a huge advantage because you'll find that some of the great stories you have an opportunity to do, you'll be on your own sometimes. And, and I have been, and, and you just have to work it out. And it's a great opportunity. Have things changed since you started out, since you were these guys' age? Like as far as the technology, as far as- Oh the yeah. I mean, the technology has changed. I remember you know, going around Iraq with something called a video phone, which weighed 500 pounds and was like in this enormous Peli case. And now you have like this little live view that you're like, it's in a little sort of backpack. Um, and I can, you know, I can feed video from anywhere now. We transfer and Dropbox and it's, it's incredible what you can do. If I have a computer and a live view and a decent light, some extra batteries and a really, frankly, I don't even need a camera. I could probably do a perfectly decent piece on my iPhone. And that's, that's just wild. Yeah. Um, somebody is asking a question that's interesting. What are the most difficult things about building a relationship with the quote unquote bad guys? And how do you convince them that you'll give a balanced voice to their stories? That's a real hard task, I would think. Yeah, it is a hard task. Uh, weirdly, I feel like it's, it's probably one of my strong suits. Um, uh, maybe because I have like a morbid curiosity about understanding bad guys. And therefore, I'm much more willing to invest enormous amounts of time in developing these relationships and having conversations uh, with them and hearing them out and listening to them. And, you know, it's a fine line. You don't want to be like, oh, that's fabulous. Tell me about the time you cut someone's head off, right? Like, no, you're not there to like indulge them or to sort of nurture their egos. And you don't have to pretend that you're not offended by them um, sometimes. But what you do have to do is make it clear that you are fair, that you are fair in your reporting, that you will be fair in your treatment of them. And um, you'd be surprised a little goes a long way in that sense. No one, even bad guys, to keep using that word, which, you know, really ultimately is, is sort of confusing, but um, no one expects you to do a story on how the Taliban are great, right? They, they know that's not going to happen. But what they, I would ask of you is, you know, if you come, you abide by our customs, right? So I don't want you complaining about having to wear, having to be covered or complaining about the fact that like, you know, 
I, you can't share a room with your male colleague or you can't frankly, you know, walk down the street with one of us or, um, you know, kind of leave some of that judgment at the door a little bit, right? And just tell the story of like what you're seeing. Um, and again, it comes down to this mutual sense of trust. So like the Taliban, for example, is a good one. We first of all went through an Afghan filmmaker and went with him who has very good contacts with them. Naji Billy Qureshi. Uh, yes, yeah. and he was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's an incredible journalist, an incredible human being. Uh, when I first told him I wanted him to take me to spend two days with the Taliban, he like thought I was insane. And then by the end of lunch, he was sort of like, all right, well, this is kind of interesting. Because I think he understood that my goal, my objective was not to make the Taliban look like, you know, murderous, wife-beating, degenerate, ignorant thugs because frankly, they've done a really good job (laughs) of doing that on their own. They don't need me to do that. My goal going in there was to see how has the Taliban changed in all these years after 9-11 and all we see of them really are snippets of videos they put out, but we don't really have, and you know, or like victories that they're achieving on the battlefield, but we don't really have a sense of who they are, how they're living now, how have they adapted, if they've adapted, um so i think if you kind of go in with an open mind and you're asking the right questions and you're making the right contacts and you're giving people a chance to get their point of view across even if you don't care for it or agree with it if you're willing to listen to them listening goes a really really a long way and then the trick is how do you sort of not have them just be pushing their agenda so hard that it overwhelms anything else you would say. In the well, you got to, you know, I mean, first of all, you have to challenge, obviously, always have to challenge in an interview, even when it's a little bit scary. Um, and um, you also challenge in, in post-production by, by, you know, okay, he says this. In reality, we know that the Taliban has been responsible for countless civilian casualties. And so you can push back in that way too. Um, and, but, but I do think that's also a good time to like have what I love about television is so collaborative, have other people who haven't just spent two days with the Taliban, have fresh eyes on a piece and be like, okay, now I'm just your, you know, I'm Betty in Nebraska right now. And I'm like, why are, why, why did he say this? Or why didn't we do this? Or, and, and that's really good to keep you focused. This is great. We have a couple more questions. If you can stick around for maybe a couple more minutes, just to sure, see, that's fine. Because <clears throat> people have asked some things. Um, one person said, "I had a question about reporting language and COVID nineteen. Various medical workers have shared their discomfort around the media's analogies between coronavirus and conflict metaphors, i.e., fighting on the front line, etc. Do mm-hmm. you have any advice when reporting or writing scripts about how best to convey the severity of the issue without simply?" <clears throat> these kinds of simplistic comparisons. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've thought a lot about this because it's such a tough one. Um, obviously, it's different. It, it it's it is, but you know, at the same time, it's a metaphor, right? So it's it's not intended. No one's saying it's literally a war zone. It's a metaphorical war zone. It's a metaphorical front line. So I can understand why some people object to it um, for a number of reasons that we don't need to get into. At the same time, when you are writing for television, your job is to be smart and to elevate the pictures, but you need to speak in language that people can understand, okay? You need to speak in ways that helps people realize the seriousness of a situation or the danger of a situation. Now, you don't want to resort to hyperbole where you kind of overuse terms so much that they cease to even kind of mean, they become cliche. But when I look at some of these hospitals and having spent time in frontline hospitals in in Syria and places like Syria, Um, There are a lot of parallels, uh, particularly with the idea of triage, for example. Okay, I got a lot of people coming in. I can't save them all. 
how do I pick who I say, right? Um, these, those are decisions that doctors in the US wouldn't normally be expected to make at that level, right? Like, of course, you have to sometimes make decisions about whether it makes sense to keep trying to resuscitate someone, but pretty rare that you'd have 80 people in your emergency room and you know you got to pick who's 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 going to get saved first and 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 who might not have a chance to be saved so i do understand why people use the metaphor um it doesn't bother me personally but i also understand that it is apples and oranges that you can resort to sort of cliche or you can be sort of reductive by constantly using that language because you're not really explaining things properly. But I think a, the trick with television, and what I think is don't overuse it. You know, you have it in there once, maybe in a piece for that. Mm. Um, and yeah. But you don't need to beat it to death until it doesn't mean anything anymore. So this is a question I don't know whether you're going to be able to answer, but I'll put it to you. Um, should White House press corps somehow unite and call out President Trump when he attacks them or misstates facts? Should it be a more united media front? Um, you know, one of the great privileges of being an international correspondent is that I do not have to cover the Trump White House. <laughs> um, and all I can really say on this is that I think that journalists are in such a difficult position right now and trying to do their job and trying to defend themselves, but trying not to get sort of railroaded into this bizarre symbiotic relationship that I don't think they actually want to be in, um, where it can feel like a lose-lose. Uh, I, I cannot imagine doing what they do, honestly. I think it's unbelievably challenging. And I don't know that there's any one good answer that will like help make it a little bit easier um, because it's so unprecedented, frankly, in terms of uh, how one would normally cover a White House. Yeah. Um, all I can say is that I have, I, I said this to Jeff Zucker once, he had me filling in on New Day as an anchor. Alison Camerata was on vacation. I had just come back from Syria and I was there for a week. This is like three years ago, four years ago. And I literally wrote, and there were every day, it didn't matter what you said, any segment you did on Trump, there was just like a tsunami of abuse that would come online. And I sent Jeff a note on like day three being like, please send me back to Raqqa, okay? Because weirdly, I am more comfortable with that because I know, you know, what the lines are and who the different, you know. So I take my hats off to, to my hat off to everyone who's covering the White House. Um, and I wish I could have better advice than that. So I'm gonna ask you uh, uh, the last question that someone has asked in a slightly different way than the way they put it. Um, it's following up on the question about bad guys and trying to get to those points of view. The question was, did a jihadi ever flirt with you? But I, that's not really, I, or try to be friend with you and friends with you and how did you deal with it? It's more like as a woman, you're dealing with these people. Are you ever faced with people who want to cross the line, who misread? Well, you know, it's a, good, it's a good, it's a good question because it cuts both ways. You know, um, there is no question. I think that as women, uh, I'm not talking about like wearing a push-up bra and a low-cut top and being like, how do I get an interview with such and such a person? But your femininity, it does often come into it. And, and particularly with jihadis for a number of reasons. Number one, you're seen as being a little less threatening than a male, right? You're a woman, you're a sister, mother, wife, whatever type in, in their mind. There's like very specific categories for women and, and not so much one for friends, but, uh, but women are in their mind softer, let's say. So you do play on that. And especially if you're playing the non-judgmental card, like, hey, I just wanna listen, I just wanna learn, I just wanna understand more. Um, 
and and even in the work I've done in Syria, not with jihadis, but like going through a checkpoint, it's a lot easier for me wearing a hijab, pretending to be asleep in the back seat to get through that checkpoint because I'm a woman and I look non-threatening. Uh, same with the Taliban. There's no way a white male colleague of mine could have done that. There, there just wasn't. But because I'm wearing a niqab and I'm there with a man and I'm basically his property, um, I was able to do it. Uh, flirtation, um, crossing the line. Yes, it does happen because, um, well, particularly with jihadis, like you can't discount the fact that like there's like a huge amount of sexual repression, right? They're basically hanging out with other dudes day in, day out. I don't know if you would call it flirting really because it's not flirting. Listen, but there's no you. question, of course, on some level, even if they're not admitting it to themselves, there is something a little exciting to them about the fact that they're texting with a woman because that is totally not in their regular wheelhouse. Um, I've never had a situation where anything kind of untoward has happened. Um, I mean, forgetting even jihadis, I've been very fortunate in my career other than, um, and you can read more about this in the book, but when Saif Gaddafi, Muammar Gaddafi's son, tried to force himself on me in Russia. Other than that, I've been very lucky um, with any kind of um, sort of crossing of boundaries in that way. But it's something as a woman, you've got to be really, really mindful of. Everyone remembers what happened to Laura Logan in Tahrir Square. And it's not just Laura. I mean, I have countless, countless friends in all different sorts of countries and conflict zones who have experienced similar things. So you, you do have to be really militant. So it can be a benefit, but it can also make you vulnerable. So I just really want to thank you. Um... I, someone else has one more question about trauma, and I, I feel like we did cover that a little bit. How do you process trauma in an investigative piece like the Khashoggi story? Do you sit down with your team and talk about it? You talk in your book about what I call therapeutic crying, which I think yeah. is very helpful. Do you process yeah. it individually? Is there a trauma protocol at CNN? Um, I don't think there's a protocol at CNN. I don't think Khashoggi would probably you know, I mean, if there, I would say CNN, if you've, been, if you've done something really wild, like a trip to Syria or something, and your colleagues are concerned about you, they might be check in with you and say, hey, would you like to talk to someone? I actually have found, again, I talk about this a lot in the book, that it's better not to go through your company, um, even if they have your best intentions at heart it's better to deal with that stuff privately because at the end of the day, no company in the world, no matter how much they love you is going to prioritize your mental health over the sort of their brand. Um, because they have, you know, they need to be careful about all sorts of things and they're worried about lawsuits and blah, blah, blah. So I always advocate to do things privately. Um, which doesn't mean you don't talk about them and you, or, or that you're repressed about them. Um, but it just means that you have a little bit more control over the process then. Uh, and again, I just think it's different things for different people. For some people, it might be therapy for other people. It might be, um, more of like, like group chat. Um, I think group chat is a bit tough with war correspondents because they tend to be a pretty tough crowd. And uh, in my experience, they don't they all feel it and they can relate to it and you know you'll read each other's books or whatever and i'll be like oh yeah you know yeah or or you'll like refer to it be like oh yeah i was pretty messed up around that time but in the moment it's it's hard to talk to your colleagues about that yeah. stuff yeah. all right i'm gonna i'm gonna say we've We've done as much as we can do. We've already gone over, taken so much of your time. Thank you so much for talking to us. I do hope that we can have you up to the campus next year when the book- I would love that. And talk more about it. It's a, it's a great book. Um, and again, we open for DuPont submissions May the 1st. And so I, I'm assuming that there will be some work of yours over the last yeah. year interested <laughs> in submitting, but anyone else yeah. on here who uh, is thinking about it, please do. And um, again, thank you very much.
Thank you guys so much. Please stay healthy, stay safe, stay well. And um, yeah, hope to come and see you in the fall. Thank you guys.